Welcome, you guys. So this is not our weekly Q&A. This is actually our first episode of the Leadership Roundtable podcast. And we are actually really excited to kick things off with our guest. Our guest is actually a friend of mine, somebody I also worked with. Her name is Nikki Sanders. And I wanted to take some time to tell you a little bit about her. But since this is our first episode, I think it might be best if Katie kind of tells you a little bit about why we're doing this and what you guys can expect going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, Gwarf and I sat down and we had the realization that every successful person that we know has had a lucky break of some sort, whether they were in the right room with the right person, they just heard a gold nugget that they implemented, there was some point where they got lucky. And our goal of this leadership roundtable is to help more people quote unquote, get lucky need a new phrase for that. So every week, what we're going to do is interview somebody that we think or that you guys write in saying is inspiring to you. Somebody that has a quote unquote seat at the table that you may want to have a seat at. So you will get to be in the same virtual room as these folks interact with somebody that you admire and really ask any questions you have about your career growth or your job search, whatever the case may be, or about being a leader for, in, for most of these. And so today's, I am super excited because this is somebody where she was able to go and make the transition from being a QA intern at the beginning of her career, all the way now to being a highly respected CTO with, well, I'll let you take it. I'll let you introduce her uh, from here. Yeah, her background's pretty nuts. So who is Nikki Sanders? She's currently the CTO of a company called Relio, where she's focused on leading a team and bu building digital assets in the blockchain space. Every time I talk about someone who's doing something technical, I sound extremely dumb. So I am going to sound <laughs> dumb, but Nikki's going to make, her, make me not sound dumb in a minute. So she's currently the CTO of a company called Relio. She's also the vice chair at the Utah Blockchain Coalition, where their focus is on advancing Utah's blockchain ecosystem. And once you start hearing Nikki's story, you will see she is very deeply rooted in the blockchain community and has a, a, a tremendous background in this space. She also started her career off by getting a computer science degree, a bachelor's of computer science degree from the University of Utah. And as she's going to talk about in a minute, her first start in this world was as an intern, QA intern. And today she's a CTO and it's not been that long. And so her rise has been awesome. And one of the things I can personally say about Nikki, because she and I work together at T0 is I think people have this sort of idea that if you want to be in the C-suite and you want to be a senior leader, you have to be able to rub shoulders with the right people. You have to know how to be, you know, play the politics game. You have to advocate for yourself constantly, be loud. And I will tell you, and you will see in a second, Nikki is, does none of those things. She's completely the opposite. She's one of the most humble people I've ever met. I remember when she'd come to work, she would always put, it was never about herself. It was always about the team. It was always about the job. She'd come in, put her headphones on, put her head down, do the work. She almost never, I can't remember a single time she ever advocated for herself. I can't remember a single time where she went to the CTO and she's like, hey, we should do dinner. We should have this or let's go do lunch. Like they all just knew of Nikki because she would just crush it at her job and her team the people that worked with her, the people that worked for her constantly had good things to say about her and not because she asked them to, just because she made sure that she was taking care of them. She helped them. She grew them. She developed them. She nurtured them. And she would work long hours just because she would spend time after work, before work, helping somebody in an area that they needed help in. And so all the things you think about when you think of like, how do I become a CTO? Nikki did none of those things. <laughs> <laughs> she just did the hard work. She took care of her, you know, her team. She focused on the company's goals and she is where she is today. And I, so for those of you who are listening today and, and aspire to become a senior leader, an executive or a CTO, hearing Nikki's story is going to be awesome for you. And so with you know, further ado, I'm just going to bring her on stage and she can share her story. Welcome Hi. aboard, Nikki. <laughs> Welcome, hey, welcome. You have me blushing, Garab. Like, oh my gosh. Ah, oh, you deserve <laughs> so all <nice>. the praise. <laughs> Thank you again for being on, Nikki. Of course. Excited to be here. I'm also, gonna move you here now. Um, for those of you who are listening live, I know a lot of you guys will catch us on the replay. So we had some folks, you know, submit some questions in before, but Nikki has been kind enough to stay on after we pepper her with some questions here. So any questions that you guys have for her, please feel free to put them in the comments. And we will kick things off. Nikki, 
Gaurav has told me so much about you. And even just for anybody looking at your LinkedIn profile, you went from QA intern to engineer, to IC, to leader, to now you are a chief technology officer at a very impressive company. Mm -hmm. The first question I have for you is have you felt qualified for every role before you stepped into it? Very much not. So um, <laughs> no, I for the first good chunk of my career, I, I every time I would go for, for a new job or take on a new challenge, I always kind of would make sure I felt super, super qualified and ready to do so before before doing that. And then I started kind of realizing, I was like, hey, like it's working, but it's kind of slow. And I'm starting to to notice that other people that are moving a little bit faster are kind of like making that leap and then figuring it out after. Mm. I was like, I, I could probably do that. I'll just, you know, act super confident. And so that's really when my career started taking off is when I just started going for things and kind of realizing like you're never going to get more than you ask for. So if you ask for things like if if you never ask, you're never going to get it right. So I started kind of pushing a little bit harder and that's when like my like really like those like leadership jumps started taking off when you say pushing harder what did that look like like tactically for somebody who's watching this and thinking man i would love to you know make that jump maybe it's not even to leadership maybe it's their first promotion maybe it's their first job search what does that look like um, as far as like a job search would go it means like applying for a job where you don't meet all the qualifications. I was reading a lot of things about how women in tech specifically are less likely to apply for a job if they don't meet like 80% of the qualifications, but like men will if they meet like 40%, I can't remember the numbers, but a lot lower. And I was like, oh, okay. So I, I did that and found that that was actually super successful. They were correct. And it was like my first big like kind of promotion was at T0 when I worked with Garav. When I took on my first leadership role, I was just feeling a little bit bored in the role I was in and noticed that it was starting to wind down a little bit. So I kind of proactively went to leadership and said, hey, I know that I hear that this team like needs um, someone to come in on the leadership side. It's not going really well. I'm looking to make a change. Um, I'd love to take it. So I just kind of straight up told them that that's what I wanted and somehow convinced them that it was a good idea for them to give it to me. I remember, you, you wanna know it's funny? I actually, yeah. so I remember that conversation because when you had it, after you had it, Sam, who's a friend of mine, and, and uh, he was the CEO of, of T0 at the time, he comes in, he goes, shit, I think we're going to lose Nikki. <laughs> and he's like, I don't know if we have uh, a, like budget in our thing and uh, to, to promote her and everyone in the room. And this is what we're talking about, about being in the room. You actually weren't even in the room. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the room was like, no, well, we have to just find a way to make it happen. We can't let her go. So that's it's pretty cool to know, like when you it, it's not when you ask is when you get it. It's all the work that comes before that, that when you make the ask, it should feel unreasonable to say no. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it definitely didn't hurt. I felt like I'd put in all the work and I'd really proven myself and I um yeah, really knew that I knew that I knew what I was doing. And I knew I was valuable at that point, and truly enjoyed the job and um, enjoyed the people I was working with. So when I went to ask, it kind of it didn't hurt that I was like, hey, I have this leverage a little bit. Like, I know you guys want to keep me around. Here's what I want. Right. When you said, here's what I want. How did you figure out what you wanted? Hmm. That was a good question. Um, in, in tech, I feel like there's a few different like routes you can really take to, um, to, you know, to further your career. You can stay as an engineer and go like the principal route and just mm -hmm. become so good at that. And a lot of these amazing engineers do. Then there's more, you know, you can go architect side or you can go leadership, like more people leadership. And while I was at T0, I started getting asked to go to like speaking events and go talk about the tech because some of our other engineers who who were just as good at the tech as I was um, just didn't want to do that. They were like, yeah. no, I, I would rather die than go <laughs> like go speak in front of a, a room. And I was like, oh, I, I, I mean, I like attention. Like, I'll do that. I can do that. And so I kind of learned how to do that on the like on the job. And it was a little nerve wracking. And so I and then I with that. So being in more of like a external facing role and interfacing with more people. I realized that that was something I kind of enjoyed. And um, I never thought I would, which was weird because since I was going into software engineering, it was always because I was like thinking, I was like, this is a good job where I don't have to deal with people. 
it's just me. It's like my work can really like show, you know, I can I can do it all by myself. I can really shine. I love problem solving. Let's go. Then I realized I was like, oh, actually, I really like kind of being more social too. And I can talk to people. And I figured I was like, well, I've been going on this, the IC route. And yeah, maybe I go the architect route. But there was this opportunity to, you know, take over this team. Um, and so I figured, hey, it didn't wouldn't hurt. I even when I was offered the job, I even was like, hey, what if I hate this? Can I go back? <laughs> and, and, they, and they were like, yes, you can. So I was like, all right, I'll give it six months. And then we'll talk about it again. So I even I tried to like build in a little like trap door in there just in case, but because it was scary. I was it was gonna be a really different day to day. That's cool. There's this question I really want to ask as you were saying this that I just thought of. So I don't know if you remember, but before I came to T Zero, I was at Overstock mm -hmm. and I was leading this massive team of like 23 people. And on paper, it was like the sexiest role in the world to some, right? Yeah. Every day I hated it. And and in fact, if you I don't know if you know this, but like we would do quarterly 360 reviews and every single review, the the thing I would wrote, I would rank zero out of 100 and zero was empathy. And it's because I just could not stand leading people. And mm. so you but you don't re sometimes you, you think, oh, leadership is the sexy thing to do. But then when you do it, you realize, well, there's all of this stuff that comes with it that you maybe didn't expect. And then for some, like for you, my trapdoor was I want out, I want to just go to T0 and just do my thing. What did you learn about leadership that you were surprised to that you didn't know that you're surprised to learn before you stepped into it that you know now? This has been an interesting kind of journey from on that side, especially coming from the engi an engineering role. I, It's kind of funny, a lot of times, it, in, in the engineering world, people get like promoted or pushed into like the leadership role just out of like seniority or who, you know, who's doing the best job. And it that tends not to be the person who actually wants to be an engineering manager. And often they hate it and go back. Um, I've known so many people like that or who would just get forced into a leadership role just just and don't don't like it um there it's a diff, very different skill set and so when you do come from the engineering side into a leadership role there's really no like handbook or training mm -hmm. that typically goes along with that which i find truly shocking now because i yeah i had to i did so much googling and watching so many youtube videos and like even look like and i was just like looking up things of like yeah of like how to run a one-on-one -on -one and how to relate to my team. I was very concerned about that because I was like, okay, the, the project side I can handle of like, you're doing this, you're doing this, like these are our goals, we'll all move together. But once you're there, you realize, oh no, in these one-on-ones, like you have to get to know everyone and their personalities and how they're all working together. And strangely enough, a lot of like my skills that came out in that is like, I'm a mom and uh, I had young children. And, I was, and strangely, I was like, um, a lot of the, like those techniques of working with toddlers really <laughs> translates into working with a room full of engineers. Like it sounds terrible, but a lot of like validating their feelings and listening mm -hmm. and problem solving can really be boiled down to kind of simple like principles that you teach children so strangely enough that there was a lot of overlap so that was shocking but i learned i learned a lot in that of dealing with like the people issues figuring out how to how different people are motivated to get things done in different ways how like people's working styles can work together or sometimes don't really work well together that yeah that's been a whole adventure that's a good point about uh, validating people's feelings. Yeah. When you, th this is a probably a question that I'm sure a bunch of people have, and I'm I I certainly have it. Is uh, you get a team, you actually love the humans on the team, but the humans, human A doesn't interact well with human B, and human B is like, well, human C shouldn't be in that role. I should be in that role. How do you not pull your hair out, A? And, and then how do you get human A, B, C, D, E, F, G to all kind of work towards the same goal and keep them doing it cohesively, I guess? Yeah, I, that happens all the time. And um, a lot of it that I found that works for me is, first of all, just trying to get everyone to rally for the same goal. Like, all right, yeah, we have different opinions on, you know, on different who's in leadership, who's doing what, but like, what is our goal as our team? All right, we're going to make this. And it's like... And that's all we can control. And let's let's do that really well. And 
um, I just try to, I always try to stay super open for feedback and like welcome it almost so people feel comfortable talking to me about things. That's one thing just through my whole engineering career that I find that kind of led me into the leadership role was I always just had an easy time getting along with my coworkers and becoming friends with everybody and just they like would feel comfortable talking to me. So I've tried to carry that part, like the easy to talk to part into leadership where we can be honest. And um, I want that to go both ways where I can be like, hey, like, dang, you missed the mark on this. Mm. This is something you need to improve on. And they know I'm saying it honestly and not not being mean about it you know, and saying it early and, and not like being like, oh, this has been a problem for six months and I'm springing it on you now because I'm just we're going to have that relationship because we're all adults like that's silly to me. Like we should, and I want them to feel comfortable the same way pushing, like if they want to push back, if they have suggestions, I try to be empathetic and, and really listen and acknowledge whatever they're saying. And, and then if I disagree, I can tell them that like, Hey, like, you know, I, I'm not seeing it from the same way. If you can prove it to me, I'm <laughs> definitely open. Like I'm not, I'm not saying I'm the smartest person in the room and I know all the answers. So if I don't, quite agree with what you're saying you're deaf like everyone's always welcome to prove me wrong I would love that but I'm not going to change my mind until I until that happens but that I, I've had super good luck with that of just that open honesty and being on their side and we're like we're all on a team if you have like let's figure out the best way to do it and sometimes I have to make a call of like no we're not going to do it that way we're going to do it this way and I've had people mad at me about that before but they usually get over it pretty fast like once we can just move on and, and start working on the projects um I'm usually pretty good at getting everyone on board. Yeah. Did you have to get comfortable with that? Like, I, I think it's hard to know. I'm going to say this thing and there's like 30% of my team that's, they're not going to be down with it. They're not going to be happy with it. Yeah. A and the people pleaser person, that side of you might be like, uh, how'd you overcome that? That has been really tough. That's been like going to therapy, honestly, of being like, <laughs> all right, how do I deal with yeah. conflict? Like you have to be so good at dealing with conflict and realizing it's not a bad, like it, it doesn't mean that you're being, that you're wrong because you're bringing up conflict and it doesn't, just because it feels uncomfortable doesn't mean it's bad. That has honestly, that's been like an ongoing journey for me. I find, I feel now in my career, I'm pretty good at it where I've grown kind of that callous maybe where it doesn't feel so uncomfortable and I can just say it. But in the beginning of my career, I definitely learned some hard lessons by maybe like not being as comfortable with conflict where it would have been easier if, if I could have been earlier on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were you, since you were an engineer, have you always been good at connecting with engineers because of that? That's something we come across a lot, especially with product folks where they're like, oh man, like it's just tough. They won't even tell me what, like they know the answer and I can't even pull it out of them in the meetings. Yeah. That's something I, I don't know how I, well, I grew up with like in kind of a really nerdy space. Like my, my dad is a software engineer and a bunch of my family members. So I was always like around computers and video gamers and they're playing like my parents would have their friends come over and play D D together so i was around <laughs> a lot of like those kind of nerdier people so <laughs> that's who i was kind of comfortable with so then when i went to college and went into the computer science program it was kind of easy to relate to them i was like oh yeah i you know we speak the same language i can joke or like i had a really thick skin so i um growing up with brothers and in that you know, area. So I could really throw down the jokes with everyone and just really get comfortable. So that was a great skill to have because then, yeah, as I became like, went into my career and into leadership, I might, I was able to relate with them. There, uh, there were situations where I found like, I would almost joke that I was a translator because I would take like, talk to the engineers and like translate up to the business side, what they were saying, and then like translate it down the other way. Cause they would be talking just the same, they would be saying the same thing and talking past each other. And I started realizing little like weird things like that where I could help. I'm like, hey, well, I, I can communicate this because it's just kind of different styles of communication. It would happen between two different engineers that just really had different ways of explaining things. And often they would be saying such like coming to the same conclusion, but they were fighting because they didn't think they were. And I just got really good at like stepping in and being like, oh, like, Let's talk about this. Maybe that is again like the toddler mom side where you're like, oh, let's, I can tell you're having really big feelings. Um, <laughs> let's, let's figure it out. And then I would like be like, I was like, oh, it sounds like so and so is saying this. And that sounds really similar to what you're saying. Like it was pretty funny, but I got really good at that and found that like I didn't hate it as much as I thought I would. Dang. I think if 
for folks listening, especially people who are trying to figure out how do I break into leadership roles, I think that's probably the biggest gold nugget of anything or like how to deal with conflict, how to so many different aspects. If you can just actually understand what somebody's saying and be able to be the translator for other folks, I don't know that there's many skills that are more valuable than that in life. Nikki, have you have you seen Little Big Feelings? Those two yeah. women. Who, is that yeah. where you got the okay? Because well, I part of it, yeah. I remember because my wife, when we had our kids, she she would watch this and she would be like, "You should watch these," and I just would never. And I remember <laughs> one time I we got pissed about something and she used that same phrase. She's like, "I, I see this is a big feeling for you." I was like, "Okay, don't bring that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know what's happening right now. I try not. I don't phrase it like that at, at work, but I, that's every time I do it. I'm thinking that I'm like I'm using these exact same techniques. It's pretty funny. Here's a quick something I think about. Like I'm a little more old school. You're younger than I am, but I think our generations are very similar in that the the path was you graduate college, you go to a job, stay in that job for X amount of years, then get your promotion, stay in that thing for X amount of years, get in that promotion, X amount. And so you like the the idea is okay. Well, by the from the time I graduate to the time I become pot potentially C suite, that's a twenty year thing. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to like people coming out of schools today or boot camps today, or you just look at like even the younger generations today, they don't want to wait. And and sometimes it's rightfully so because they're finding better ways to do things. And in other cases, it just might be because they're so accustomed to like, in, you know, instant gratification. What advice do you have to somebody who's just coming out today and they're trying to rush it into leadership and they're trying to grow as fast as they can. Are you in the school of thought like, well, no, you got to earn your stripes or are you, how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, it kind of, you know, depends on, on the person and, you know, their, their skills. But I found that a lot of my success um, as an engineering leader is because I was a really strong engineer. When I have engineers explaining topics to me, I can really grasp it and explain it and, and have a really helpful conversation with them where if I can show them that I understand what they're talking about. So when, you know, we're making decisions about it, they trust what I'm saying. I have worked with, you know, leaders or, or seen other engineering leaders who are not as strong on the engineering side. So when they make decisions, sometimes the engineers on the team just don't respect it. And that can be really difficult. I've seen engineering leaders who are completely non-technical, but just great on the people side. So you definitely can go go that way. But most of the successful engineering leaders I see are truly respected engineers first, mm -hmm. and can talk the talk, walk the walk. And then when they're making those decisions later, um, their team trusts them. I think it's a huge issue of trust, right? If there's someone coming in who you don't think that they know what they're talking about, and they probably couldn't do this on their own, um, but they're making these decisions, uh, that's going to be a tough pill, pill to swallow. For me, I try to any decision I make, it's something that I could do. That's good. I had a question, but I know Katie does too. So I, I, I'm hogging all the time. <laughs> One thing that as you were talking, even before you said like you weren't in the beginning stages of your career, you were far more hesitant to take on a role that you thought you weren't qualified for. Then mm -hmm. there's that switch. For somebody who is trying to make a jump into leadership for the first time, but they don't have that experience. It's like that whole chicken and the egg, which comes first. What advice would you give to them? I would say become kind of almost like a de facto leader. Um, before I became like an official on paper, like leader, I would step up to the plate and help people with things. I mm. would be a little bit louder and try to talk about things. I would try to get in the room a little bit. Um, not too much because I definitely I was like I the idea of being pushy still to this day is just not in my personality. But if like the opportunity came up came up, I would I would make an effort to to step out a little bit. And that helped a lot because then I became just known amongst the team. Everyone knew who I was. I you know, it's it's silly. I run into this a lot with engineers and I did too. You don't realize how important like the networking and people side of it can be because you kind of assume, oh, it's just going to be a meritocracy. Everyone will see my work and, you know, the cream will rise to the top, which can can happen. But if you wanted to get into leadership, you're never going to get there if people don't know who you are. Engineers won't care to know who you are if you're cocky about it. It's almost like you have to just be personable and get to know them. And it's kind of, it's like that grassroots type thing, which I wasn't thinking about like strategically at the time it was just i was going to be friends with the people i worked with and 
we were going to, you know, all get along and I was going to learn about them. And we, I was going to, when I knew had this knowledge that they needed, I was going to be helpful and I was going to jump in and, and help and share and be like willing to, yeah, just like having that willingness to help. So then when it was time to take on a leadership role, it just kind of felt like a smooth transition. Mm, interesting. Do you, something that we hear a lot is people end up wanting to leave a company because they feel like they aren't getting like the kudos or the praise that they want to get or the promotion that they want. Was there ever a time when you were doing that? Like, it sounds like you were from what Gaurav shared and what you've shared. I think you're being very humble. You probably went way above and way out of your way to help people along the way. Were there any points where you had that feeling like I'm doing, I should be getting paid for this now? Or was it always in your mind like, it'll come down the road. No, of course, there, there were times when I was like, dang it, like, why are they not noticing this? And a lot of it was when I started realizing I was like, Oh, if I'm not loud about this and not talking about it, no one's gonna know, no one's gonna read my mind. If I'm just working really, really hard, they could think, Oh, she's super happy about like with what she's doing. She doesn't want to change. It was like a weird mind kind of set shift I had to go through when specifically, like the team I was on the um, the team lead had left. And I had been there the longest at this point, I was one of the youngest engineers, but I'd been there for a long time, I, I knew this stuff. And I was like, Oh, cool, I'll, I'll probably just get tapped to, to be the team lead. And that didn't happen. Someone else who's a very good friend, super smart, deserving person got it. But I was like, I was a little like, oh, like, ir like irked about that and um, realized I was like, and then and talking to people, people didn't even know I wanted it. And mm. that was for me, like the first sign of like, Oh, you're right. They like, they're not gonna guess they're not going to assume. Um, y yeah, you're never going to get more than you ask for. So I started just trying to be at that point, a little bit more vocal, and uh, a little bit more. Yeah, just put a little just pushing a little bit more, like not obnoxiously. So like not bringing it up every day, but just in my one on ones with the leaders, just keep bringing up, hey, someday, this is what I want. These are my goals, and started just working towards that in the day to day. You know, what's what I think is interesting, too, is that you're that you're talking about is that no one's going to know that you want it. But also a lot of times now I'm talking external companies, no one's going to know how good you are. Yeah. Like you might be the bomb at T0, but no one else knows that. And right. one thing I noticed about you is when you left uh, your last company, Nerd United, and then now at Relio, that, that happened like that. And since T0, you have been on podcasts like this. You've been at speaking events. You have your own podcast. And so there's this aspect, too, that building a personal brand is becoming, in my opinion, and I want to get your take on this, even more relevant today than ever before. Like, I think, like, if you want to keep moving up and you want to, like, what I think is unfortunate is a lot of times when people start their job search, it's because they got laid off and they realize like, I don't know anybody and nobody knows me. Mm -hmm. And so we advocate all the time in uh, building your brand. So for, but a lot of people feel intimidated about building a brand or putting thought leadership out on LinkedIn or whatever. What do you think are some, I guess, easy ways for anyone who is apprehensive about being out there to start building their own brand? Yeah. that And that's, Wow, so poignant, because I went through that where finally, I realized I was like, okay, if, I, if this is what I want, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to need some sort of brand or presence, mm -hmm. right? But how do you get there? Day one is so intimidating, because you just feel so dumb. You're like, I have 300 LinkedIn followers, like, it's going to look so stupid if I just start posting. And honestly, I've started to learn like, Every, everyone is a novice when they first start and everyone looks dumb when they first try something and the people like who matter, they're not going to judge you. So it's, you just have to start doing it and it feels weird and it feels uncomfortable. And especially with an engineering background, um, not, I have never been super outgoing. It was, it was just really uncomfortable. Um, I did not enjoy it. And I kind of had to force like push through that and just act Again, it's like fake it till you make it. Just act super confident. And once it starts growing, it feels a lot more natural. So it feels weird for the first little bit. You get used to it. And that has been just instrumental, I think, to my career because I don't I wouldn't have gotten a lot of the the roles and like the opportunities I've gotten if people didn't know who I am. Cause mm -hmm. how would they, right? You you and and 
no one's going to adv- advocate for you better than yourself. Yeah. Dang, that was so good. You uh, <laughs> you just said something that I that you breezed right past, which is, oh man, I just lost it. Oh, you said those who are above you would never judge you. And that is so on point. I think the pe- like people get scared of, if I post something, this CTO is going to think I'm so dumb. Right. Right. But <laughs> instead, that CTO probably looks at you. It's like, man, good job for trying. And, and I understand what you're trying to do because they were once where you were, right? Exactly. Even for me, sometimes that would make it almost more uncomfortable because then I was like, oh, people think I'm tr- like, am I trying too hard? And people can see what I'm going for. But really, like most people, are they're not paying attention to you, yes. right? They're, they don't care. It's also, I, it would be like, for me, it would be this uncomfortable moment of, oh, there's already all these other people doing this. They're already talking about this. There's already people like this, like really having kind of um, like, there's like a scarcity mindset about it and uh, and having to push through that being like, no, there's room for me. Like I can do it too. Just because there's other people do like talking about this and with this kind of audience doesn't mean that I can't be part of it. Um, mm-hmm. Which that, that was something I had to come over like in my own head as well. Yeah. Why not me? Yeah. You know, what's interesting about that as you were talking and Gaurav was sharing how like you started speeding up. It seems like as you were going through, it's like, oh, we hit like some momentum. Mm -hmm. I think there's a really interesting thing that happens when somebody does put themselves out there is most people are secluded to a resume and like a 15 to 60 minute long conversation. Mm -hmm. And that is all anybody gets to know about you. Whereas like now, like Gaurav, neither of us wanted to ever post on LinkedIn or do anything like that was a a big like, we still don't necessarily love doing it. But one of our favorite things is when someone officially meets us for the first time. And I feel this way about you. It's like, this is our first time ever talking. I feel like I know so much about you already because of what you've like opened up and what you've shown us. And I think for people looking to grow in their career, sometimes they forget, like you may not put your best foot forward, especially if you're an engineer, you're somebody who's a little bit more awkward. Like uh, I'm very awkward as a person. It's like yeah. I need all the bats like that I can get because it's unlikely that my first impression is going to be phenomenal. (laughs) That's a great way to put it. It it gives you so many more opportunities to showcase who you are, your intelligence, what you care about, like who, like what your personality is. So like, I mean, kudos to you. I like, I am so, so excited for like the people. Hopefully there's one person, even if there's one person that listens to this and is like, you know what? I'm going to post today once a week for the next year and see what happens. I love it. Yeah, that would be that would be great. Because that's how I started. It's just like this awkward, like, mm, I'm gonna try and um, <laughs> it's gotten better. It's gotten better. <laughs> if you could go back and or if you could give 13 year old Nikki Sanders some advice, what would okay. you tell her? Oh, so many things. People don't care about what you're doing. Like, again, like, and I feel like as a teenager, I was so self conscious. I was so, so introverted and shy. Um, I really just like tried to disappear. And I really regret that. I'm like, dang it. Like, you, yeah, I didn't have to do that. Um, but it, but at the same time, it was nice because um, I was really able to just like focus on school. I was like huge, you know, like overachiever, try to get like all of the top classes, all the top grades, which definitely served me well in the long run, l- learning how to learn. So I definitely don't regret that. But I wish I could tell her to be just a little bit more confident in herself and that she'd get there. It, Yeah, at the time it was like, I, I just was a, such a little shy wallflower. I wish she could have just like, at least she would know that someday that would change and maybe that would make her feel a little more confident. That, that. Yeah, me too. I, that people don't care. That's the best thing. You overanalyze any like conversations you've had. You're like, I sounded dumb and I still do that. And I've tried to be like, nope, you know, like they're not going to remember this. Like, I don't remember conversations I've had where someone said something really dumb unless we like laughed about it. And and then I don't care. People are, yeah, no one cares. And <laughs> it's, isn't it silly? Like we were, care so much, but really like they'll remember the good things and they'll remember the times that you're nice to them and the nice things you say. And they're not going to remember the time that you flubbed your words. Gaurav, what do you say people remember how you made them feel? More than I say it? nobody cares about how much you know until they know about how much you care. And mm-hmm. I think Nikki, you embody that. Uh, you embody that really well. Because I again, 
like if we went back at, a few minutes ago and we, we think about like what most people think they have to do all the time to get ahead, it's like they have to showcase how good I am. There's a way to do that, but it's not just that. Yeah. <laughs> it's how other people feel about you too. We have questions that came in from the audience that, that came in in advance and we want to ask them. Uh, are you cool with that? Yeah, let's go. Okay, but the first question's from me. Okay. <laughs> Selfish question. I'm going to put you on the spot. Where, where do you think Bitcoin's going? <laughs> to the moon. To the no. moon. No. 100K? <laughs> I mean, eventually. It's a deflationary asset, so I really don't see it having a possibility of doing anything but trending up. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm a like big advocate and fangirl yes. for, for blockchain tech and Bitcoin, but I don't see it going anywhere, um, especially knowing all the things that are getting built around that ecosystem. Um, yeah, it's sticking around and yeah, it'll hit 100,000 definitely within the next few years. So hodl. My wife keeps telling me to sell our, our crypto. I was like, I haven't no, sold no. it since 27. Like I bought it in 2017. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. There we go. Oh, Diamond man. hands. Yeah. Diamond hands, man. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, just for our disclaimer, we are not giving anybody trading advice yeah. here. Like asterisk, not trading, like not financial advice. Yeah, not financial, no fiduciary advisors here. But I do think something going off of that, the next question somebody asked was why blockchain? Like of all of the, the sectors in tech, mm -hmm. where do you rank blockchain in terms of getting a career, starting building a career? How do you rank blockchain? And why do you like it so much? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot to that, but I kind of got, I kind of fell into it in kind of a funny way, actually. It was because Overstock, you know, was spinning up this little, the Medici Ventures kind of research and development arm. And um, at the time I was at Raytheon and, do, you know, being back-end software engineer, which is awesome, but it, I was so bored, you guys. Um, the tech there is just really, like, they have to use kind of older technologies because it goes through so much red tape, you know, before you can use it as a defense contractor. So I wasn't really learning any new tech. I was I was kind of behind and I got my degree from the from the University of Utah. And there was a group of us who'd go out like monthly ish and get some beers and like just chat. And I was talking about how I was bored and a good friend of mine was somehow one of the founding engineers of this T0 Medici Ventures. Um, and he was like, Oh, like, you should come work with me. We're doing this blockchain thing. Wait, and who I, was that? Eric Fish. Oh, okay. And I had I was like, I think I've heard I've heard of Bitcoin, because some guy was mining it on like the computer lab machines back in the day <laughs> in school, which yeah, dang it, I should have done that. But so I'd heard of it, but knew nothing of it. But it sounded exciting. And he was like, Yeah, it's a startup. But but we're, you know, have the backing of overstock and it changes every day. And it's crazy. I was like, all right. So I kind of just jumped on board. So I kind of fell into it. And this was 2015. So pretty early on, and just had to dive in the deep end and started learning about it as Ethereum became a thing. And like smart contract development became a thing. I was pretty early there. So I have a bunch of patents in that area and got to really dig deep on it. So it just really was interesting to me because it was learn. I, I was constantly learning. It was changing. It was growing. It was exciting. So now I'm almost in too deep to leave, but it's also <laughs> still an exciting space to be in because that has continued. It has not stalled out. Like the growth has continued to happen. It's continually changing. Yeah, there's like AI seems like the new hotness right now. Um, there's always going to be some new hot tech that comes in and I'm definitely keeping an eye on it. And, um, you know, we'll learn about it and see how I can incorporate it. But I just have really grown to love blockchain tech as a whole. Just I love the idea of, you know, the auditability and like, the more something is visible, the less like secretive it is. And I love that idea. And the whole like on the money side, the democratization of capital, like really helping like bank the unbanked and getting money to like, people who haven't had access to the current financial system, just you know, personally just feel really passionate about that. And so technology like blockchain can really help push that world forward. So that's why I've stayed. Oh, that's cool. So really the the advice you'd actually give 13 year old Nikki is be kind, nobody cares and buy Bitcoin is what you <laughs> Yeah, I'd be like, there's going to be this thing in 2008. Don't ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> Do you? Okay, you know, it's what, a year ago, uh, almost a year ago, Katie's like, Listen, I think AI is going to take over the world in the next like one year. And I was like, no, it's not. It's like, I don't I don't think that's happening at all. Do you fear? I know you're probably excited about AI. The geek in you is. But do you fear we're going to lose our jobs? And if if I'm in tech, I should only focus on AI or I should only fo like, what do you think about that? I feel like 
this kind of panic happens um, anytime a new kind of groundbreaking technology comes out. AI has been around for a long time. Just because it became kind of sexy with ChatGPT and OpenAI um, doesn't mean that it hasn't been here and hasn't been happening. I think that will continue. I always kind of figure that economics will fi fix the problem, right? There's jobs that 50 years ago, like that don't exist anymore, but there's new jobs that exist now. I feel like, like it'll just shift, right? Like the job market will shift. Maybe, you know, AI will take care of a lot of like the basic, you know, software engineering, like workloads, um, but it's boilerplate stuff we didn't love doing anyway. Like the problem solving and the creativity part will still be there. It's just like the job market will, sh will shift a little bit, but I'm, I'm not too worried. What's the next question we had came in? Oh, by the way, you also, you're like, you're just like, oh yeah, I, and I have a couple patents. What patents do you have? Oh man, I, I think it's four now. They're all from T0 around like um, smart contract patterns for digital securities. Okay, so <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome, but go ahead, K-Mac. Um, okay, next question. So this one is, uh, they asked it with you specifically, but I would love if you could take this broad too. What do you look for within your own company or within your own teams to determine who should get promoted? It's like, what should somebody be thinking about if they want to get a promotion? Really, it's, like the the showing that they can do it and that they want it again mm. for a long time i was thinking it but i wasn't saying it um and sometimes show showing it isn't everything like it is something like obviously if someone comes to me like i want to run the new team and i haven't seen like any sort of skills that would show that they would be successful in that that would be um that would probably you know get not not approved right away but so it's really yeah it's like building up those skills and starting to take on those responsibilities without being asked. And then also telling me, because again, sometimes engineers get forced into leadership roles that they truly do not want because just because they've been around the longest and they're like, they're the most knowledgeable. So it's like really the two sides of ability and like, like being loud about it. Thank. Okay. When you say, okay, tactically, because I think this is something that a lot of folks, especially women struggle with, where it's like, okay, you've got to speak up for yourself and you've got to do it. And I think sometimes there's a big disconnect between doing the action and doing the action well. Mm -hmm. And I think most, I'll speak for myself. I definitely, it's like, okay, the first time I tried to speak up for myself, it was, <laughs> it was a blunder through and through. Yes. How do you get better about speaking up for yourself mm -hmm. without any, but making anybody feel any sort of way? Yeah, for me, I was really uncomfortable speaking up in a large group. It started where I would just, I could talk to like my manager in like a one-on-one -on -one or to my coworker in just like a one-on-one -on -one situation. And once I started getting more comfortable with that, it helped to have those kind of advocates on the team for you who you've already told them like, do you feel this way and you have these opinions. So when you bring it up in the group meeting, it's not the first time everyone's heard it. You have people who have agreed with you and already kind of run through the idea a little bit, like poked holes in some of it so you can solidify your idea. And then when you bring it up, it's just, it's nice to have kind of those advocates on your side who even if, I mean, especially as a woman in tech, frankly, sometimes you do get overlooked. Like it happens. I, um, I've had it happen and to have someone who can advocate for you and bring it up and be like, oh no, like we need to listen. Um, that's a game changer. It just, it really helps to get people on your side kind of before you bring it up in front of a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So start in the one-on-one -on -one and then widen from there. Yeah. I've always been more of like kind of a grassroots kind of girl, I guess, where I'm like, oh, let's talk. Like, I have a question. What do you think about this idea? And I do that to a few people. And then once you bring it up, like, people have heard about it and people know what you're talking about. Interesting. So even that, Gaurav, I think this is one of your superpowers too. The way you just phrased that, it's not, hey, I think we should do this. When you were starting in those grassroots, it's, hey, what do you think about this? And my assumption is like from that, you got even better feedback where it's like, maybe you didn't have, you weren't a hundred percent of the way there. Maybe you yeah. were in the beginning, 50% of the way there, 90%, whatever. And then you're able to take that feedback and then just increase your odds where it's like, you're almost going to the market, hearing what the market wants. And it's like, oh, now we have this formulated. Oh, exactly. Idea Why everybody... would you? Yeah. No, it's 100%. It's the same thing. Like you don't go in blind. Like you should <laughs> bring a completed product without going to the users first and getting product market fit. Do the same thing with ideas on an engineering team. Fill them out first, like with the stakeholders and people you trust. And by the time you bring it up with everyone, everyone's already on board because you've already talked to them. That's yeah. Awesome. When you talk about finding people to advocate for you, 
if you think about external ways to do that, are you part of any user groups or anything that you'd recommend for not just women, but people in tech to join? Hmm. Not really, honestly. That's hmm. a really good question. Yeah, I found, but man, I try, I try to go to things. I find I go to more events when I'm at a conference out of the state than I do when I'm here locally in mm -hmm. Salt Lake. Ooh, which like I'm terrible at this. So I know more people like when I go to Miami, I, I have way more friends that I go out with than I do here, which is weird. So I need to get better at that. But it is helpful to have like those group of people who are outside of your company, who are going to share your posts and are like love, love your ideas, even though they work for different companies. And honestly, like that's been huge in my career is just is getting those kind of like advocates outside my immediate circle. That's it's so helpful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions that came in? No, Katie? I think you ended up covering the only other one was kn knowing what you know now, what would you change or do differently? But I feel like you kind of you kind of answered that throughout. So I think we are so dang grateful that you <laughs> took the time to come be here and answer all of the questions, give trading advice and all of the above. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much. It was so, so happy. And I'm sure we'll get incredible feedback from folks. Yeah. It's a replay as well. And yeah, for being for our first it. guest. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm excited. Yes. Thank you Hopefully so much. it went well. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what's next for you? Maybe not career wise, but what are you excited about? Like, in, man. like something you want to do in the next five, 10 years? Oh man, that's a good question. Uh, well, so one big thing, my son will graduate high school in like two and a half years. And awesome. I've been in Salt Lake, you know, his, yeah, since he was his born because um, with the custody situation. So once he's graduated, I'm like, I might move. So I'm starting to look at like different locations that I might want to live in. So that might be fun in the next like three years. And then besides that, like, yeah, I'm doing a lot of traveling this this year. I, I love going to crypto conferences with my like, you know, but yeah, it, it's a great time just to, you know, meet the people in the industry, keep catch up with everyone hear what everyone's working on. So I have a fun, a bunch of fun travel things this year. I try to keep it down to, to not too often, like max once a, once a month, but have some fun trips planned. That's awesome. Yeah. My crypto conferences are like, unlike any other conferences. Dude, <laughs> it is. It's a whole thing. It, it, yeah. At the circus. Lambo's outside. Yes. <laughs> Depends on how good the market is. When yeah, it's a down market, right. it's a little more quiet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, awesome. Well, thanks again for being here. Uh, Katie and I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye.